Welcome to another EduMed video and this is another video in the airway pressure release ventilation APRV series and in this video we're going to talk about how to deal with hypercapnia in a patient who is on APRV. We'll talk a little bit again about what APRV is but I'd really recommend watching the first few videos in this series which give a good introduction into what it is and the nuances of it. We'll touch upon the different factors that affect oxygenation and CO2 removal and then talk about the exact settings that we would use to manage a patient who is becoming hypercapnic or even hypocapnic depending upon how the patient is getting on. As I've talked about in every single one of my videos on ventilation, the most important thing to bear in mind is this picture here. All oxygenation relies upon is the alveolus being open and there being blood flow going through it and fresh gas with oxygen coming into the alveolus. CO2 on the other hand depends purely upon the carbon dioxide being able to diffuse freely into the alveolus so you must have good blood flow into the um, around the alveolus and therefore CO2 to be able to diffuse out into the um, alveolus and then an easy method of the gas moving from the alveolus out into the um, endotracheal tube, i.e. there must be patency throughout the whole of that system. <coughs> if we think a little bit about oxygenation first, oxygenation depends upon only four things. The fractional inspired concentration of oxygen, the alveolus being open, doesn't matter whether that's during inspiration or expiration, all you need is the alveolus to be open for there to be gas to transfer from the alveolus and into the blood supply itself when you're thinking about oxygen. We keep emphasising the fact that alveolar blood flow is really important because actually most people forget about it, but it is a vital component to um, the oxygenation of blood. And the alveolar blood interface, which is usually the disruption um, that causes hypoxia. This is through um, infection with pus and inflammation or with pulmonary edema in, for example, a patient with acute left-sided heart failure. The focus of this talk is on carbon dioxide. And the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood depends purely on two things in normal ventilation, be that spontaneous ventilation or conventional ventilation. The first thing is the minute ventilation. This is the bulk flow of gas moving from the lungs and out of the mouth, either through an endotracheal tube or in spontaneous breathing, just through the mouth itself. Minute ventilation is dependent on two things, the tidal volume and the respiratory rate. And in fact, minute ventilation is calculated as the tidal volume multiplied by the respiratory rate. So if you can increase the tidal volumes, or you can increase the respiratory rate, or both, you will increase CO2 removal. I keep emphasizing this, but alveolar perfusion is vital. There is no point in having bulk movement of gas out of alveoli if they are not supplied by any blood, and therefore there's going to be no removal of CO2 from the blood and into that alveolus. This is really important in patients with low cardiac output states or those where you want to adjust their pulmonary vascular resistance um, to try and improve blood flow and therefore ventilation perfusion matching. APRV is slightly different to other modes of ventilation and again if you, I'd really recommend watching the first few videos in this series to get a better understanding of this. But APRV during its high pressure phase all of the airways are rendered open and if you imagine the lung is constantly getting filled with carbon dioxide and you've got a continuous column of gas from the alveolus all the way through to the ventilator naturally gases have a tendency to move down a concentration gradient so if you imagine the lung is full of carbon dioxide and the ventilator has no carbon dioxide there is going to be passive diffusion of carbon dioxide from the alveolus and into the ventilator that is what we call passive diffusion so in 
APRV, we have to consider passive diffusion as part of our CO2 removal, but the frilly bits that we talk about in APRV, which is extreme CPAP, are the releases. And so the releases allow us to give bulk movement of gases, which can then be calculated as your minute ventilation. And by recruiting up more lung units, you increase the amount of area of lung tissue that is taking part in uh, ventilation, and therefore you can improve carbon dioxide removal. So again, just to emphasize, what is APRV? APRV is extreme CPAP, so it's just a very high pressure to open up all of those disease bits of lung to take part in oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal. And in order to try and improve the amount of carbon dioxide removal, we develop bulk flow, and that is through the release phase. So you've got the high pressure and very, very occasion, you get a release of um, the pressure which allows gas to move out of the patient and into the ventilator and therefore remove CO2. As we uh, emphasized in previous videos, there are only five things that you can set in APRV. The FiO2, the high pressure, so the pressure which they, the ventilator is at for most of the time, which opens up all of the lung units. The T high or the time high, that's the amount of time that it's at that high pressure. The P low, which is usually set at zero or as close to that as possible. And then the time low or the T low, that is the amount of time that the pressure drops down to that pressure low. So when thinking about hypercapnia and APRV, really what you want to try and do is to increase the bulk flow of gas. APRV is quite good at producing some passive diffusion of CO2 out, but for most patients you need to also add in an additional amount of bulk flow. So how do you increase the amount of gas that's released during each release phase of the APRV? Well, the first thing that you can do is expand the lungs up a bit more. If you increase the pressure high, what you're doing is you potentially increase the amount of gas that's in the lungs. And therefore, during each release, you can there's a bigger pressure differential and therefore you get more flow of gas coming out of the lungs and into the ventilator. This is obviously limited by a couple of things. Firstly, hemodynamic stability. The higher the intrathoracic pressure, the more impedance there is to right ventricular filling, so you reduce venous return into the right ventricle, and therefore you might reduce the cardiac output of the heart, and therefore the amount of flow going through the lungs, and therefore the amount of oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal will be impaired by that. Secondly, you really don't want to go above pressures of between 25 and 30 centimetres of water because then you come into an issue called barrow trauma or pressure tr uh, damage to the lungs. If you imagine a balloon, you blow it up too much, it'll pop. And then the same can happen with the small alveoli in the lungs. And that can cause pneumothoraces or just fractures and inflammation in the alveolar wall itself leading to lung fibrosis over time. You can decrease the T high. What does that do? So if you reduce the amount of time that it's at the high pressure, what you're effectively doing is you're increasing the number of releases per minute. <clears throat> this is the same function as increasing the respiratory rate for the patient. Now it's not quite the same thing as you're doing releases, but effectively amounts to increasing your minute ventilation. And the other thing that you can do to try and increase the amount of gas that comes out of the lung is increasing the T low. Now I don't suggest this, but it's worth thinking about this theoretically, because what you're doing by increasing the amount of time that it's at the low pressure is you're allowing more of the gas to exhale out of the lungs and into the ventilator, and therefore washing out more carbon dioxide, again effectively increasing your tidal volume. So these are the things that you can do to try and increase bulk flow.
Now, the other thing that's worth thinking about is trying to recruit up more lung. If you recruit up more lung, then you've got more surface area of the lung that's taking part in gas exchange, which may actually improve CO2 clearance. If, for example, you've got half a lung that's collapsed, you suddenly see the CO2 increasing because actually you've just effectively halved the amount of respiratory epithelium that's taking part in CO2 removal. Now, it's not quite as simple as that because there's also the perfusion ventilation mismatch, but again, we'll go through those things in a separate video. So what you want to try and do is to improve the number of ventilatory units. You want to recruit up as much alveoli as possible. So the things that you can do there is increase the p-high as you would do with increasing bulk flow. Again opening up more alveoli units. If for example an alveolus is thick and inflamed and needs 25 centimeters of water to start opening up and you've set a pressure high of only 20 by increasing it up to 25 or 26 centimeters of water what you can do is suddenly pop that alveolus open and therefore increase the amount of gas exchange that is occurring. Paradoxically, you could increase the T high. Now, what that does is it reduces the number of releases per minute, but what it can do is allow more time for more alveoli to spring open and therefore increasing the surface area of respiratory epithelium for which gas exchange can occur. And the final thing with, again, trying to keep as many alveoli open for as long as possible is to decrease the TLO. Now, by decreasing the TLO, what you're doing is not allowing as much of the pressure inside the lung to drop and therefore keeping as many alveoli open as possible. Now, it's worth having a look at our final video in this series, which will be on the advanced method, advanced techniques within APRV, where we'll talk a lot more about the biomechanics and physics of APRV and why uh, we set pressures and times at the times that we do and the pressures that we do. And you can calculate that relatively accurately for a patient. So changing these things can be a little bit more difficult. Then finally, and the thing that people often forget about, and the reason why APRV has only really come into the fore more recently, is that this is primarily a spontaneous mode of ventilation. We want patients to be breathing whilst they're on APRV. We talked a little bit about compliance curves before, and the important thing about APRV is actually, even though it might look at the end of the bed like the patient's uncomfortable, hyperinflated, often these patients need to be at that high pressure so that they're at the right point in their compliance curve of their lungs to be able to breathe easily. And if you can reduce the sedation for a patient, they start breathing more spontaneously. You can see in this picture, the first um, CPAP phase, there's no breathing. So the only gas flow that you see in the bottom graph here of gas flow, the red one, there's a release phase where there's gas going out of the patient and then into the patient. And then there's no real movement. Then if you look at the second CPAP phase, you've reduced down the sedation and then the patient starts breathing for itself. You've still got those release phases where you get the bulk movement of um, gas coming out, i.e. CO2 clearance. But on top of that, you've also got a couple of spontaneous breaths where the patient's breathing in and out. And that can increase your CO2 removal quite significantly. And this is the special thing about APRV and why not all ventilators have it. To be able to breathe and to allow the spontaneous breaths on top of these high pressures and the very quick releases, you need very accurate and very special valves, bidirectional valves that allow breathing whilst maintaining a pressure of 20, 20, 25, 30 centimetres of water, and also ones that allow very quick opening and very quick closing. So in the order of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a second. And so that's why only relatively newer ventilators have this mode of ventilation. 
but it's a very important method of trying to reduce CO2 is actually reducing sedation and allowing those spontaneous breaths. So in summary, if you've got a patient who's hypercapnic on APRV, the things to think about are increasing the bulk flow by increasing the pressure high and um, decreasing the time that it's at the high pressure so as to increase the number of releases but also thinking about increasing diffusion as well by extending out the pressure high um, as for a, so having a longer time high. Always think about perfusion. Don't forget that ventilation with the ventilator is only half of the um, issue with gas exchange. The other half is getting the blood into the lungs and around the lungs. So make sure you've maximized cardiac output and you haven't overpressurized the um, th thorax and therefore impaired cardiac um, output by producing venous return. You can see here there's a lot of different bits that you can change here to get the CO2 right. And the simple matter is that you need to fiddle with all of those. The technique that I would suggest is by starting off by trying to improve the bulk flow. And then if that's not really working, then moving on to thinking about alveolar recruitment. For the most part, this requires a little bit of chopping and changing a few blood gases, and it can take four to six hours to really get a patient into a good position. So don't be disheartened if the first changes you make actually make things worse. You just need to find what the right thing for this particular patient is and that is through understanding the pathophysiology of the problem. Is it that all the alveoli are collapsed or is it actually more to do with the fact that they've got a high metabolic load and therefore you need a higher bulk flow of gas out of the patient i.e. more releases per unit time. I hope you found that video useful and if you did please like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell notification. There's going to be lots of videos coming out on APRV. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible.